Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I call you to order, please? Thank you. Um, I I'm delighted to introduce Peter Tatchell as our next speaker. Uh, Peter, of course, doesn't require any real introduction, so what I will say will be around the subject. Um, our paths first crossed about 30 years ago, though Peter was not at the time aware of that. Uh, Peter was fighting a by-election in Bermondsey as the Labour candidate. Uh, Bob Mellish, wasn't it? Bob Mellish was the old... Session, yes. Bob Mellish was the old Labour MP, very old Labour, and uh, Peter was the candidate to replace him. I, of course, was campaigning furiously for... Robert Hughes, the Conservative candidate, not for Simon Hughes, the Liberal candidate who did win. Uh, that was one of the various confusions of that election. <laughs> but, uh, no. In those days, of course, Peter and I would have had very little to discuss, not least because I was um, sort of hardly even shaving yet, but uh, partly because we were on different sides of the great tug of war that was 20th century politics. During the 20th century, certainly during the 20th century after the Great War, all politics was a tug of war. You were pulling on one side or you were pulling on the other. I was pulling on the side of big business, right-wing conservatism, uh, the American alliance, and all of the usual things. Peter was pulling on the side of better living standards for the working classes, Michael Foote, and all of those things. And although we might have found, had we sat down and had coffee together, that there were many points on, on which we agreed. Of course, Pete was a lefty, and I was a Tory fascist bastard. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 but that does make, uh, it, it is rather like uh, being friendly with the German in the trench 50 yards across the line. You, you, you can wave, you can shout, you, you can uh, throw over the occasional tea bag, but ultimately you're on the other side and there may be a time when you have to put a bend in his guts or something. Um, now, of course, things have changed since then. They've changed because the end of the Cold War has changed everything. Uh, the, the collapse of Soviet power and the collapse of old Labour-style socialism in this country was like uh, taking a heavy paperweight off in a, in a drafty room, and the papers have been blowing around ever since to settle where they will, and they've often settled in a more rational way. I suppose the other thing is that uh, I personally had 18 years of growing and profound disillusion with the Thatcher project, and Peter then had uh, a rather uh, a similar period of disillusion with the Blair project. We're, we're both older and wiser. We do not necessarily believe our political leaders anymore, and I, I suppose we have found at the end of 30 years that the things that unite us, i.e. a commitment to civil liberty and to general decency, uh, is perhaps a little more important than our continuing disagreements over things like the economic role of the state. Uh, and so it, it, this is not the first time that Peter has spoken to a Libertarian Alliance conference. I think the first time was in 1992. But um, I, I am very happy uh, to have Peter here today. Uh, Peter it is not crossing no man's land to have tea with the other side. We, we are in this room all on the same side. And so, with, with those few introductory words, I would, ladies and gentlemen, give you Peter Tatchell. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Yes, I guess um, many of you may have been wondering why a left-wing green like myself was addressing a Libertarian Alliance conference. And I suppose the reason is quite simple. Um, although we may disagree about issues concerning the role of the state, economic policy, of the environment. On issues of individual liberty, I think many, not all, but many left-wingers and Greens share the Libertarian Alliance's perspective that the rights of the individual, the individual freedom, is a paramount humanitarian value and must never be sacrificed for the sake of a bigger, grander goal, 
whether it be political, economic, environmental, or any other kind of goal. So what I want to do today is to share with you some of the contradictions, the difficulties, the uh, common ground that we might share around the vexed issue of multiculturalism. And I want to start by perhaps beginning with a critique of my own side, so to speak. I think it's true that some left-wingers and some Greens have adopted a far too uncritical, unreflective attitude towards the ideals and values of multiculturalism. Uh, I know from my own experience that many people on the liberal left spectrum, many Greens, um, are reluctant to engage in these issues for fear of being branded as racist, imperialist, or Islamophobic. All of which charges have been thrown at me over the years. I think that the principle of universal human rights is under attack and has been under attack for many years by some of those who espouse multiculturalism. Um, they have insisted on the idea of cultural difference as something that must be respected regardless of the consequences of that cultural difference. Um, when I look, for example, at the situation in Iran over the last year, I think we can all see very clearly how silent, how silent so many sections of the left have been about that heroic struggle for democracy and human rights. You know, where have been the mass left-wing protests against the Ahmadinejad dictatorship, against that fraudulent election, against the suppression of civil society in Iran. Too often we see the left making excuses or apologies for tyrannical regimes because they happen to be anti-American. Um, and that logic to me is absurd and stupid. If you take the view, as many on the left do, that the United States is an imperialist or neo-imperial power, that it is one of the major obstacles to human progress. You don't have to agree with that, but that's, that's the perspective of some people on the left. Even if you take that view, it does not follow that therefore one should ally with or apologize for those regimes which happen to be anti-American, but at the same time suppress and oppress their own people. And I have found it quite disturbing, quite disturbing, the way in which some people on the left, I'm not saying all people on the left, but some people on the left, have tended to either remain silent or actively apologize or excuse the Iranian regime on the grounds that it's anti-American and therefore an ally in the fight against imperialism. There have, of course, been some honorable left-wingers who have not adopted that stance. You know, there have been protests at the support uh, at, the, at, at the jailing of um, Iranian trade union leaders like Mansour Sanlu. There have been protests against the suppression of women's rights protests and women's rights organizations. But these have been quite small, quite small. And when you compare the huge protests against the Iraq war, um, the huge protests against American intervention elsewhere over the decades, I think there is a moral contradiction at play here. In the United Kingdom, I think we see firsthand the way in which often today race and religion have been allowed to dominate and become predominant in determining political stances. There seems to be a hierarchy of oppression, that some forms of oppression are deemed more are worthy of condemnation than others. And in particular, I think we often see that there are sections of the left who sometimes seem to, I emphasize seem to, um, allow the rights of women, gay people, and others to be sacrificed 
in the name of cultural sensitivity and respect for diversity. Um, while everybody in our society is in theory supposed to be equal in the law, some people are deemed, by some people, some people are deemed uh, to be more equal than others. Race and religion often trump gender and sexuality. And we see that even in the way in which our legislation uh, is framed and enforced. Um, we see the Equality Bill. You know, we had an Equality Bill which came into law this year, which uh, ostensibly, in my view, with very good purpose, sought to guarantee equal treatment and non-discrimination to everyone. Yet, in an apparent sop to religious organizations, some of the clauses exempted protection for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, uh, particularly the clauses on harassment in the Equality Bill. They actually have sub-clauses that specifically state that these protections shall not apply on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. So even if you do not agree with this kind of legislation, even if you take the view the state should not be legislating around equality and non-discrimination, the fact that there are contradictory levels of protection and that certain groups are excluded is surely a cause for concern. I also know that in my own experience, um, I did a big campaign with my colleagues in Outrage against several leading Jamaican reggae and dancehall singers who openly advocate the murder of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Butch Banton, for example, put out a song called Boom Bye Bye, which advocates shooting gay men in the head, pouring acid over their bodies, and burning them alive. Um, now, it's very interesting that no action was taken against that singer when he performed those songs in this country. For many years, um, radio stations, including the BBC, played these types of songs. But then again, when people advocate violence against Muslims or Jews, Hindus or black people, they were invariably arrested, put on trial, convicted and in some cases jailed. So again, I ask you, even if you do not agree with this kind of legislation and law enforcement, the fact that it is unevenly enforced, the fact that certain groups are protected and others are not, strikes me as um, a perverse interpretation of multiculturalism. Because we were told at the time that it was racist to condemn these singers, that hatred of gay people and even violence against gay people was part of Jamaican culture, as if this was somehow an excuse or a reason to look the other way and ignore incitements to violence, which I may add, incitements to violence are a criminal offence in this country, in Jamaica, and in virtually every country in the world. Um, likewise, we have seen a number of Muslim fundamentalist clerics uh, being allowed to advocate the killing of gays and lesbians. Um, I think many of you will have seen the Channel 4 program, Undercover Mosque, where one cleric openly advocated killing homosexuals. We also heard the example of Imam Abdul Muhid in East London, who likewise, in public pronouncements in the street preaching, um, urged the killing of gays and lesbians. Uh, none of these people have been prosecuted. But you'll also be aware that um, when Sheikh Abdul Al Faisal, um, some years ago, advocating, advocated the murder of Jews, Hindus, and Americans, he was promptly arrested, put on trial, convicted, and I think sentenced to nine years imprisonment. In my view, a rather excessive sentence. But nonetheless, that was the verdict for someone who advocated killing Jews, Hindus, and Americans. So again, why the double standards, and why is it that some sections of the left seem to adopt a view that certain communities have to be protected at all cost, and those who incite hatred or violence against them must be arrested and put on trial, whereas others who advocate even more extreme 
uh, incitements to violence and murder do not excite their attention and condemnation. Um, I'm sure that um, any woman who sought to challenge the Muslim clerics who advocate genital mutilation of young girls, uh, the clerics who advocate the murder of unchaste women, I'm sure that any woman who sought to challenge them and call for them to be killed would almost certainly be arrested and put on trial. Yet the misogynists within the fundamentalist strand of Islam who advocate these actions against women do not ever end up in court. Um, to me, there is a problem here. A serious problem. How do we get in such a moral mess? I think the multicultural ethos that has blossomed since the 1960s was an important advance in social evolution. I think it's undoubted progress to recognize, celebrate and respect diverse communities. I think multiculturalism has empowered often previously marginalized and disadvantaged minorities, led to great understanding, led to a more inclusive society. And I think it's been a very useful antidote to the boring monoculturalism of the 1950s when I grew up. I think it's a good thing that we accept people of different cultures. Uh, we embrace different nations, races, languages, religions, abilities, and sexualities. And to me, the right to be different is a fundamental human right. In a democracy, we have the right to self-expression. We have the right to be different, or we should have. And so, in that sense, multiculturalism has given a space in the public sphere to a whole range of peoples and communities that were previously excluded. And I see that as a good thing. Um, but then again, these are the positive, liberating aspects or benefits of multiculturalism. But what about the downside? I think by asserting and celebrating difference, multiculturalism can also divide people on racial, religious and other grounds. Uh, it can emphasize or overemphasize divergences between different communities. And these divergences can often spill over into rivalries and antagonism. Uh, on the state where I live, um, the main racial tension of recent years is not between black and white youths, but between Asian and Afro-Caribbean. Uh, we've also seen in many other instances um, rivalries, contradictions and tensions between different strands of Islam. Uh, the Amiria Muslims, are uh, widely condemned and despised and have suffered considerable harassment even in this country by adherents of Sunni and Shia Islam. Um, to me, this subverts our common humanity. This interpretation of multiculturalism subverts our common humanity. It undermines the notions of universal rights and freedoms and creates a new form of tribalism social tribalism, whereby societies are fragmented into myriad communities, each loyal primarily to themselves and with a diminished interest in the common good of society, let alone co a commitment to the collective welfare of humankind as a whole. A particular interpretation of multiculturalism has, in my view, pave the way for the splintering of the humanitarian agenda. I mentioned Iran. I can think of so many other examples. Um, people are fragmented according to their different and sometimes competing identities, values, and traditions. These differences are prioritized over shared experiences and interests. Our common needs and the universality of human rights are downplayed in favor of religious and racial particularities. Uh, I think we saw this authoritarian, divisive strand of multiculturalism at work in the way the former mayor of London 
Ken Livingstone, in the name of cultural diversity and the defense of Muslim communities, allied with right-wing Orthodox Islamists in the Muslim Council of Britain and the Muslim Association of Britain, to the exclusion of liberal progressive Muslims, in particular Islamic reformers like Sheikh Kakwani, Urshad Manji, and Sheikh Mohammed Yusuf. These people were not invited to City Hall, but Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi was a, a Muslim cleric who has been on record as justifying uh, a whole range of human rights abuses against women gay people, and Muslims who turn away from their faith. Yet it's interesting that when you analyze it, according to the polls at the time, uh, only 4% of Muslims said that the Muslim Council of Britain represented them. Simultaneously, only 1% of Muslims said the Muslim Association of Britain represented their point of view. Yet these were the organizations that the then mayor of London, Ken Livingston, was uh, embracing and working with. Another disturbing development is the tendency for multiculturalism to be cited as a justification for tolerating beliefs and behaviors that conflict with liberal humanitarian values, such as the veiling of young girls in Islamic societies. Some left-wingers and multiculturalists have uncritically defended the hijab and the burqa, rarely ever acknowledging that many of the world's 700 million Muslim women and girls wear the hijab or the burqa, not by choice, but because of pressure from families, imams, and their communities. You know, they do not wear these items of clothing by free choice. They do so because of social, cultural, and religious pressure. And in many Islamic societies, for women not to wear these items of clothing will put them at grave risk, not just of ostracism and abuse, but perhaps even physical violence and even death. So it, it concerns me that some people interpret multiculturalism in a way that defers to the orthodoxies of the people in power within Islam. Um, it doesn't respect the individual rights of Muslim women to make that choice. It doesn't defend and assert that. It defers to the collective demands of orthodox Islam, and in particular, the dominant forces within Islam, you know, the imams, the religious leaders, the jurists, and so on. Um, this, to me, neglects the rights of minorities within minorities. You know, Muslim women who do not want to wear the hijab or the burqa, they have just as much right to make that choice. And they are a minority, an often unheard minority, within the Muslim minority. I think we need to say that multiculturalism must defend their rights as well. The end result of all of this is, I think, increasing moral confusion, equivocation, compromise, <coughs> and double standards uh, over human rights abuses here and in many parts of the world. I ask myself, is it really a form of neocolonialism, as some on the left allege, to insist that every person in every country is entitled to human rights. I don't think so. Uh, when people campaigned against apartheid in South Africa uh, many years ago, I don't recall anybody saying that this was the imposition of Western values on South Africa. It was an act of solidarity to support those South Africans, black and white, who wanted a non-racial future. It was based on the principle of universal human rights, that just as black people in Britain should have equality and be protected against discrimination, so should black people in South Africa. 
So if it was right to give solidarity with people struggling against apartheid in South Africa all those years ago, why is it wrong or just not happening that sections of the left don't give solidarity to people struggling for those freedoms or similar freedoms in Iran today? Um, some on the left seem to say that these international human rights conventions are Western inventions and impositions. But that's not true, because as we know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drawn up by people from all continents and all cultures. Um, moreover, it's been endorsed by all the countries that have signed up to the United Nations. So it's not about imposing Western values upon these countries. It's about asking them to adhere to the humanitarian values that they have signed up to and agreed to abide by. Um, I think the worrisome trend um, is linked to a very perverse, extreme interpretation of multiculturalism, which leads me to ask this question. Is multiculturalism still a positive force for the upliftment of marginalized and suppressed peoples? Or has it, in fact, sometimes become a Trojan horse for the violation of human dignity in the name of respect for cultural traditions and difference? Um, can the right to be different, an important and, to me, fundamental human right, sometimes collude with and act as a cover or an excuse for the abuse of human rights? I think these are real dangers. But despite these dangers, I continue to defend multiculturalism. I think the principle is right, but I defend multiculturalism with the following important qualification. Multiculturalism is a force for social good, providing it does not promote values and practices that sustain prejudice, injustice, and suffering. So when multiculturalism leads to the violation of other people's rights and freedoms, then it has gone too far. When it leads to silence and collusion with the oppression of others, then it has gone too far. To me, a good and beneficial multicultural society is one in which all citizens have the freedom to pursue their own different values and lifestyles, while in the public sphere, all citizens are treated as equals before the law and are bound together by a commitment to universal human rights, regardless of the differences in their personal morality and private lives. I do not require people of faith to approve of homosexuality, but I do ask them not to discriminate and not to preach hatred and violence against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Christian fundamentalists are at liberty to believe that homosexuality is wrong. Um, they are quite entitled to hold that belief and to abstain from same-sex relations. Um, Christian husbands and wives who believe in strict male and female role divisions within the family home, believe that men should do certain jobs and women should do other jobs, they're entitled to that belief. You know, they can live their lives, their domestic lives accordingly. But what I don't think they have the right to do is to insist that their homophobic and patriarchal interpretation of scripture should become the law of the land and be imposed upon everyone else. Um, where multiculturalism has gone off the rails is, I think, in its institutionalization of difference in the public sphere through institutions like, or in initiatives like the state funding of faith schools, which factionalize pupils along religious lines. Another big error has to be to bow to demands for, quote, cultural sensitivity, permitting some communities to be exempt from the norms of human, universal human rights when it comes to issues uh, like incitement to homophobic violence, as I mentioned before, and uh, like the exemptions in the Equality Act, which I previously cited. Um, in all these areas, I think that multiculturalism has gone too far. Um, 
Nowadays, I would say that moral and cultural relativism is gaining ground. We're told that every community is different, with different values and different ways of dealing with issues. Um, we're told by some that all these differences are equally valid and must be respected. To question them is often admonished as an attempt to impose our way of life on others, a form of what they call cultural imperialism. Now, I'd say that it's true that there is no one-size-fits-all blueprint for all societies and communities. Um, there are no universal uh, uh, exemptions, in my view. There are universal humanitarian values that should be defended in all cultures at all times. I don't think we can say that everything is relative, that we should accept practices in other communities that we would never accept in our own. If we do that, then we are saying to people of different cultures, your rights, your freedoms, don't count as much as ours. I think to allow people in developing countries, for example, to suffer indignities that we would never tolerate in our own society is a double standard, and it has more than a whiff of racism. Um, while embracing multicultural diversity is often a good thing, we have to accept that beyond a certain point, a live and let live attitude ceases to be liberating and becomes oppressive. For example, when sections of the Sikh community persecute their own members who happen to be gay, or who dis persecute those who subscribe to dissident factions of Sikhism, surely that's not acceptable. Or when they successfully force the closure of a play, as you recall in Birmingham some years ago, the play Betsy, um, I don't think that's acceptable. I don't think that kind of intimidation and censorship is multiculturalism at its best. I don't think it's multiculturalism as I understand it. It is an infringement of personal freedom of expression. So I'd say that um, all peoples possess a culture, but this does not mean that all cultures are equally valid and commendable. There is a great fear nowadays of saying this. There's a great fear of many people on the left to criticize and condemn other cultures because of this fear of being branded as a cultural imperialist. But I think we need to say it very loud and clear that not all cultures are equally valid and commendable. Some values, some values and ideals are better than others. In the Enlightenment was better than the Dark Ages. Uh, fascism, fascism is better. Uh, fascism, sorry. <laughs> Steady on. Steady on, sir. I'll start again. Um, the, the Enlightenment was better than the Dark Ages. Um, freedom is better than slavery. Uh, democracy is better than fascism. An egalitarian society is better than an elitist one. Peace is better than war. Social justice is better than social injustice. Scientific knowledge is better than superstition. And future civilizations will no doubt be better than our own. We need to say these things sometimes. Um, while all human beings deserve human rights, not everyone's beliefs and traditions deserve respect. Religious and political ideas based on racism, patriarchy, homophobia, or class privilege are, in my view, unworthy of respect. They need to be challenged, not tolerated. They should never be indulged in the name of multiculturalism and respect for other cultures. And this, I think, is the challenge for us in this multicultural society, to be able to make this distinction between the good things about multiculturalism, the right to be different, the right to individual freedom of expression, but then also to draw a line at when those rights and freedoms step over the boundaries and become oppressive 
and uh, persecute others. We need to say that multiculturalism is a good thing in principle. In practice, it has brought many benefits. But sometimes, in some circumstances, it has been a step too far and has in fact become a force for reaction. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're running rather late at the moment, but uh, I, I make no apologies for that. I think it was well worth listening to everything Peter had to say. Um, you know, I, I voted for Peter when he ran for the Greater London Assembly many years ago, <coughs> and I did sort of a vague sense of duty, but now I feel rather proud of it. <laughs> so, have a good lunch break, everybody, and let's come back and have an interesting question and answer session. <laughs> Thank you, Peter.